Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. Today we are looking at the largest muzzle-loading firearm ever built. It's not actually Fort Ranella, it's actually the Ranella batteries. Let's go take a look. So what you're looking at here is a 100 ton, actually 150 ton if you count the mounting and the shell itself, muzzle-loading rifled naval fortification gun. The origin of this thing goes back to 1866 when the newly formed Italian Navy, it's Italy having just recently been formed into a single nation from a conglomeration of states, they decided to flex their military muscle and get in a fight with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, they outnumbered the Austro-Hungarian Navy something like four to one and they got into a big naval battle and got completely obliterated. It was a really embarrassing experience for the Italian Navy and in fact took them almost a decade really to get over it. When they did, what they decided to do was kind of make a military naval comeback with the biggest, most powerful ships that could possibly be built at the time. And they actually sort of uh, uh, designed these on the idea of the um, the, the Merrimack, or the, I'm sorry, the Monitor, the ironclad ships from the U.S. Civil War, a, a heavily armored ship with guns in rotating turrets, uh, a significant departure from naval vessels of centuries past. Well, the British, of course the Italians have a, a big presence in the Mediterranean, the British also had a major presence in the Mediterranean, they were trying to protect uh, their trade route from the Suez Canal and, and beyond India, uh, through the Mediterranean up to England. And so they needed to, they were paying attention to developments in the Italian Navy. And when they saw the Italians developing these super battleships, they decided, yeah, you know, we need to come up with something to counter that. So the British started developing their own armored super battleship. And the Woolrich uh, arsenal came up with an 80 ton muzzle loading cannon uh, to arm this British, these British uh, battleships with. 80 tons being basically the biggest gun in existence at the time. The Italians played back the other way by actually requesting from Armstrong, one of the major armaments producers in the world at that time, uh, a design for an even bigger gun. And Armstrong, despite being British, designed a 100 ton gun for the Italian Navy. Uh, there was no state of war between Britain and Italy at the time, this wasn't you know, he was allowed to do something like this. It was just that the British government was keeping a watchful eye on the, the activities of Italy and anyone else who might be operating a naval presence in the Mediterranean. So the Italians outfit a couple battleships with 400 ton guns. These things have a, an effective range of something like five miles. Um, they are they massively outclass anything else. Uh, that exists at that point in time. And at this, we're, we're talking approximately 1880 at this point. Now, about the same time, the British send out some, uh, the, you know, these Italian battleships exist. And the British are now concerned, in addition to their own naval, what, in, in addition to their own naval vessels, what about their fortifications on places like Gibraltar and Malta, uh, major naval stations in the Mediterranean. And so they do an assessment, and what they come to realize is that the guns that are being used to defend places like Malta are seriously underpowered. These Italian battleships should, could show up and just bombard the British fortifications while being completely safe and out of range of the British guns. So the British decide that they need to outfit Malta and Gibraltar with larger field pieces. And they actually turn to Armstrong to get those guns, and they order four of the exact same guns that the Italians have. And they outfit two of them here on Malta, uh, one on either side of the, the Grand Harbor in Malta, and they outfit two of them on Gibraltar. And eventually, uh, two of these would be destroyed, they would be scrapped. And, and today, we only have one surviving example on Malta, which is this one, the Ranella battery, and there's one surviving example on Gibraltar. All right, so a hundred ton gun sounds pretty impressive, but you know, a lot of these old cannons look pretty heavy. So a few of the, the other statistics that I think will really drive home just how, that's the magnitude of this thing a little bit better. Uh, it fired a 2,000 pound shell, a, a literal one ton shell, and perhaps even more impressively, the black powder charge used in this gun was 450 pounds. That's like 200 kilograms of black powder. It was an immense amount of powder. Uh, there was actually danger of shattering windows in the city alongside here when they fired this thing with a full charge. Um, perhaps, let's see, equally impressively, um, 
the barrel life of this thing was 120 rounds. After that many, the, the throat erosion and the rifling erosion was sufficient that its range and its accuracy, accuracy would be significantly impaired. At that point, in theory, the gun could be rebarreled, uh, rebored, uh, but that would have to be done in England, which would mean taking this thing out and shipping it back to England, which is no mean feat. Um, to put this in perspective, it was shipped here to Malta, uh, one gun in one ship. Uh, they had two here and they were both shipped independently. Once they got it into, off, offloaded from the ship and in the harbor, to get it from the harbor up here to its mounting point took 87 days. Uh, this thing is, the, the scale of everything surrounding this gun was incredible. Um, it would penetrate 15 inches of steel armor, uh, which is enough to take out one of those Italian super battleships out to about three miles, and uh, had a maximum range of about eight miles. So uh, for a gun made in the 1880s, not trivial. Now, when we think about muzzle loading 450 pounds of powder and a 2,000 pound shell, there are some real logistical issues that come up. Think about that. How do you actually get a 2,000 pound shell into the barrel of that thing. He kind of can't. Well, Armstrong was known in England not just for arms production, but also for a lot of really impressive large-scale industrial works. Hydraulic uh, steam engines, or hydraulic cranes, bridges. He built uh, one of his other particularly influential constructions was a, a rotating bridge in England. You know, these huge engineering works. And he applied that to this gun. So not only was this the largest gun in existence at the time, and in fact the largest muzzle-loading gun ever made, it was also the first fully automated gun, because this was set up with a steam engine and loading system to get a rate of fire of one round every six minutes with a crew of only 35 men. There's a whole system built underground in this fort to load this thing, and that to me is the coolest part of the entire system. All right, so this sort of perspective may give you uh, a little better idea of just how difficult this thing is to reload. So what Armstrong came up with was this really cool system. And we're going to start from the, the very beginning with the steam system that pr uh, provided the power to run it. However, I want to, uh, to start by showing you this perspective along with this right here. And this turret in the wall alongside the gun is one of two uh, basically reloading stations. So after the gun was fired, it would be swiveled around to this point, so basically 90 degrees into the fort, the barrel would be dropped down, and the barrel would actually be placed in this hole. That center support beam is modern there and wouldn't have originally been in place. Then the reloading process can commence. And we have a second matching one here on the other side. Right. Well, what we have inside here, what we're standing now, is basically the machine room, the beaten half of the fortification. And okay. Inside here, you have a hydraulic system powered by a steam engine. Okay. So you'll be able to move the machinery around because that's, uh, it is the world's largest cannon, and you will be able to move it around with your. Uh, brute force. Right, it's 150 tons of, mm -hmm. of steel and iron. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, so instead, we have the machinery here. So what they have here is a steam boiler. Okay. Uh, this would basically build up the pressure of steam to power two machines. Uh, okay. Two steam, two steam engines. Uh, they would both have the same purpose. It was to pump water into two accumulators. Okay. So we have a smaller one of these here. Uh, this one was used for the cleaning out process of the cannon. Okay. Uh, because when you're firing a muscle of the cannon, you get a lot of gunpowder flying everywhere, with embers everywhere. And if yeah. you load it again with more gunpowder, oh. and you are firing the cannon inside of the fortification. So that's true. You want to get the whole barrel nice and, and all the all the sparks put out yeah, exactly. before you dump powder down it. Exactly. Also a good thing with handheld muscle motors, of course. Yes, exactly. Right. So uh, this would basically power the pump, which we have on the wall over there. Okay, that would pump water inside of a small accumulator. There was this hole over here. You say small, but that's like 20 feet deep. Yeah, well, the, this smaller one would just be remounted on the wall here. Okay. Then you would have a big one for the main machinery. Okay. So this one was just for the cleaning out process. Uh, in the back would be the engine for the, the full cap, the machinery. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so this would be the engine itself. Okay. 
So this would be able to pump all the water from outside of the fortification down into the accumulator over here. And the accumulator is basically a big metallic cylinder okay, with a piston up on top and a weight that pushes the water down and kept it under constant pressure. Okay. About 950 psi. Okay. If you want a comparison, the Tower Bridge over in London has about 750. Wow. Okay. So, so, so the idea was the steam engine just lifts this weight on a tower, on a column of water. Yes. And then gravity actually does the work of compressing the water, well, pressurizing it, yeah. compress, into a series of pipes that provide power for the whole Armstrong mechanism. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the accumulator okay. here would then be powering the cannon, uh, the, the rammer, and the lift. Okay. It's, I was going to say, for, we, we should go take a look at that. However, it's kind of amazing to me how this little tiny engine <laughs> and even this little tiny boiler power a gun that is so incredibly massive. There's, there's an interesting uh, contextual thing going on there. Yeah. All right, so this gives us our, our actual power to run the equipment. Yes. Let's go take a look at what that equipment is. All right. All right, so we are in a gallery underneath what the, just underneath the right side of the gun. So the gun is like up there, right? Yes, it's here. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Right. So, what is this? Well, this is the road engine. This is where all the ammunition will be prepared for the camera. Okay. So, um, basically down here, we have this set of tracks, which you would have cops going back and forth to the camera itself. Okay. Uh, and on the left-hand side, we have the cartridge store and the shell store. Now, the shell store would hold up to 100 uh, one-ton shells being prepared for the proceeding to be loaded into the cannon. Okay. And in two different kinds of things, depending on what target you have. For example, you have high explosives, which can be fixed with percussion caps in the front. Okay. So they basically explode an impact. Or armor piercing ones, which would basically have a point in the front and a time fuse in the back. So they're able to penetrate through the enemy's armor and then explode on the inside. And hopefully hit the over and this gun powder still inside of the ship or something like that. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was the idea. Uh, depending on which kind of shell you have, you would load it onto the cart, then you push it back to the cartridge store, and from there you would have been issued 450 pounds of black powder, or 200 kilograms, depending on what you like. It's still just a mind numbing black powder. Yes, so they need to be very careful down here because of the safety procedure. You know? Right. Because you can't carry around any kind of flames inside here, you can't have any metal. And for example, right now, if I would walk inside here with this uniform on, then uh, most likely I would get a floppy or a picture. And you've got a hot nail. Yes, yeah, exactly. So this could set up a spark as well, which would be kind of gunpowder. So basically, before I entered the building chain I had to change it to a, a, a T uniform, especially a cotton uniform with wooden buttons and uh, leather shoes without any kind of metal. Okay. And shorts and those box of plates. Okay. okay, and even these windows. Yes. Are, these, these are like spark proof lights. Yeah, exactly. Since you can't bring in any kind of uh, lights or flames inside here, instead of behind the wall, say, you have a corridor with the window panes. So you can put in lanterns inside of them, so we, they're, they're trying to remain here. No. No. In this part of the 19th century as well, we start to experiment with electricity as well. But light bulbs during this time have a tendency to explode. <laughs> so Not a good they kept on more simple forms of lighting up this area. Okay. So, all right, so we have a car running on these rails, which unfortunately was scrapped in the 1950s. So, uh, but you bring your cart back to here, and you would actually, so you go past the power, yes. and you get the shaft from the, the store here. Yes. And uh, there's your answer to how you move a 2,000 pound shell. Yeah, exactly. You have a windy windy system there. Okay. Uh, it's up to time to be able to lift it up. Uh, so that will be lifted up to the here, and carried over to the cart, and then lower down to its place. Okay. And then you would actually push the cart backwards. Yes. To the issue patch. So once you've got the shell, then it comes back to here, yeah. and you're going to get powder through this little 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 door. Yes, exactly. The issue patch. Uh, 450 pounds or 200 kilograms, uh, separated into four separate satchels, okay. uh, which would be 50 kilograms in each, so it'd be easily more easy to put it onto the cart itself. Makes sense. Yeah. 
Exactly. And then once the gun powder was onto the cart, you would then make sure that you had a gas seal on the back of the shell itself as well. Yeah. And that provides your rifle as well. Yeah, exactly. The gas seal would be perfectly fitted for the rifle inside of the gun. Okay. And that would also make sure there's no gas leaking on the side, which gives you even further range and more accuracy. So once we've got our, all of our ammunition components, we're going to run it down to the end. Yes, exactly. To the loaded. To the lift. Okay. Yeah. So inside here, um, in this shaft, you then find the hydraulic lift, okay. powered by the hydraulic system from the machine room. So this is where our steam power actually first comes into play. Well, the interesting thing is that this wasn't powered by steam anymore. Right? As soon as the pressure was up, the, the steam was turned off. It was just hydraulic pressure from the water. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to have the steam engine running to have the machine room to work. Okay. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah. So uh, the high pressurized water would go into pipes underneath the lift here, and then push the whole lift up, and align the cart to the hole on the left-hand side up on top here. All right, so that, and that's the hole where the barrel would be sticking through. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right, and then from the hole on the other side, on the right-hand side here, the ram would then come out, and then we'll then push the gunpowder and the shell in one piece all the way back to the breech of the cannon. Okay, that's a long barrel. It is. That's got to be a long ram. Yes, it is. And that, again, is hydraulically... Yes. Yes, hydraulically powered with the hydraulic power coming from the original steam power. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so that's all controlled by a soldier up there with a set of really cool steampunk levers? Yeah, most likely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we were standing up there with these levers to operate everything. Okay. So they basically had some communication with him up on top of that. That would actually be done with these screws that they had in the wall here. Hmm. Side down, so you would have pipes. So basically, you had a communication system up on the ship. And that's like the old school speed control. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so you can be down here and come have a conversation with the one up on top. Okay. This is literal steam pump. Yeah. Like when it was high tech and not just exactly, exactly. retro. Yeah, it's <laughs> for, for, the, for the people back in those days, this would be sci fi. Yeah. All right. Yes. And now there are two entire galleries like this. Yes, you have the, this reloading chamber here, and you have another one on the other side of the wall here, on the other side of the shell stone. Exactly like this one, just nearer to it. Oh. So you basically have four carts going back and forth with ammunition. Okay. So yes. this was actually like the slow part of the process. Yes. The gun could fire fast enough that you had to have four separate carts cycling through this loading process to exactly. get going. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, apparently, on the Italian battleships that were outfitted with these guns, the rate of fire wasn't one round in six minutes, it was like one round in 20. Yes, exactly. Because they didn't have space for a 60-foot long rammer yeah, on exactly. the ship, and they had to go through some sort of hijinks to get Yeah, exactly. And also, their the accumulator would be smaller as well. Uh, the ram they would be using basically foldable. So, <laughs> it was a very long process. No, but, to that day, but they would have four cannons on each ship, so get them all loaded to start with. Yeah, exactly. All right. And you said the water pressure in the accumulator would run for would be enough to cycle this whole mechanism four times. That's uh, the information that I had. Yes. Okay. And then you'd have to fire up the boiler again. Yeah. And rebuild your steam pressure. Yeah, exactly. But well, I assume well, while you're going through these four rounds, you basically start with the machinery up. So okay. while, while that was working, then the machinery would be prepared. Okay. So this can maintain a continuous rate of fire. Yes, as long as the machine works, you should guarantee rate of fire of one shot every six minutes. Okay. And how many times was this actually uh, fired in combat? Never. It was never fired in anger. Okay. No. Uh, this was uh, used as a deterrent of the 19th century. They would test fire the cannon four times a year. Nope. And they would take these test results and send them to the enemies of the empire. <laughs> so especially the Italians then. Yeah. Because if you have this shotgun in the garden, no one dares to trespass. That makes sense. So the ramming chamber itself is located up here. This was 60 feet or 18 meters long. It was a wooden ramrod. It goes all the way down there. And then up here, out into daylight. So. Uh, the, the bright light there is the end of the ramming chamber, which then goes through the loading turret and into the gun barrel.
So the ramrod would come through this hole. We have in the center of the loading turret here, this would be the hydraulic lift. So you would have a, a carriage that would come up, or a, a cradle, I suppose, that would come up with your projectile and powder. You have a soldier standing over on that platform right there, operating some cool levers to make the whole thing work. And then the gun barrel comes through that hole on the opposite side of the wall uh, for the, the shell to be rammed into. So that's a pretty cool system, but uh, it is kind of dependent on that steam engine right there. So if someone managed to get a lucky shot on the steam engine, does this whole battery go out of service? No, in case of uh, that would happen, or the steam engine broke down, or you ran out of coal, you need a reserve system. And that would be the chamber that we're standing in here right now. And that would be a pump room uh, with two manual pumps. So we would have uh, 40 sodas sent from the gasoline to stop pumping away on these, <laughs> to build up this pressure inside the accumulator. That sounds like a fun detail. Yeah, well, <laughs> I would like to be one of those soldiers. <laughs> They would be working down here for four hours to build up the, the pressure inside the accumulator. And imagine doing that here in Malta in 40 degrees heat. They're very heavy. Jeez. Yeah. With the steam engine, it will only take four minutes. So we wanted to make sure that one was up and running, or else you might have a mutiny down here. All right, so just to give you a final overview here, when the, the gun would fire, and by the way, it fires with a friction lanyard. So there's one guy standing like right out here with a string, he pulls the string and the gun fires. That, that's gotta be the best paid guy in the entire garrison. He probably wasn't, but he should have been. At any rate, once the gun fires, it's then going to rotate 90 degrees over towards this loading turret. The barrel will initially be up above the loading turret where the small accumulator uh, has built up a bunch of hydraulic pressure. You open a vent and a hose, a pipe on top, is going to flood the barrel with water. That will douse any live embers in it then they can actually bring the barrel straight down. So there was originally a, a hatch and counterweight over this loading opening. So as the barrel came down, the loading port would be covered. The water would rush out of the barrel as soon as it went past vertical or past horizontal. And then by the time, as you were lowering it, by the time you got down to the point where you were getting into the, the loading port, the water would all be out. The barrel itself would actually pull the, the hatch down and lift the counterweight up. You'd lower the barrel until it was in line with this hole. Then you have the whole uh, hydraulic loading apparatus that is going to ram a powder charge and a shell into the barrel. You then rotate the gun 90 degrees back or wherever your target is. And uh, you have another guy operating. I should say the rotation and the elevation of the gun are also operated on the same hydraulic system. So you then have a, a gunner with levers to control the elevation and the traverse of the gun. He'll bring it onto target fire again, and then the process repeats, loading from the opposite side back and forth, because it takes more time to actually get a shell and powder charge up here and functional and ready to load than it does to actually fire the gun. So the gun ultimately went into service in 1886, and I think we know what happened in 1886. Smokeless powder gets invented, and this gun is basically obsolete the very day that it's introduced. Now. That doesn't mean it stopped working. Um, the gun would continue to actually stay in service until 1906, when it was formally taken out of service. Um, at that point, you know, new modern, uh, new modern powders and artillery pieces would have rendered this, in fact, obsolete. Uh, it stayed in British military hands until the 1950s, changed hands a couple of times between the different services. In the 1950s, the British military actually had a program to scrap all of the obsolete old guns that were in fortifications in Malta. Unfortunately, this led to the destruction, the scrapping of a lot of antique cool cannons. Well, and it led to the, the torch cutting and scrapping of the other 100 ton gun here on Malta. However, it was the army that did that. And at that time, this battery was actually in the possession of the Navy for some bureaucratic reason and the Navy for whatever reason, didn't scrap this gun. And so this ended up remaining in place. In 1991, it was given to uh, the Malta, uh, Malta Heritage Trust. They turned it into a museum and opened it up a few years later, having restored the whole battery, as you've seen. Um, the gun remains, of course, a lot of the hydraulic equipment was scrapped, you know, for use as scrap metal, uh, after the place became obsolete. This was used a bit as a bomb shelter during World War II. It was uh, used for storing equipment and supplies 
for the military. It saw various uses, but nothing significant after 1906. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. I know I thought it would be cool to come out here and see the biggest black powder cannon ever built, uh, but it really, to me, what really makes this to a cool installation and a cool piece of history is the entire automated loading mechanism that went along with it. This truly was steampunk before steampunk existed. This was cutting edge technology at the time, and the rate of fire and just the sheer magnitude of this gun uh, remains impressive today. So I'd like to give a big thanks to the Malta Tourism Authority uh, for helping to arrange this and make this possible. Uh, great folks, there is an immense amount of history here on Malta. Everything from five, six, seven thousand year old ancient temples uh, to the war rooms from World War II. So if you ever happen to find yourself in the middle of the Mediterranean and don't mind a bit of wind and sun, definitely stop by Malta and check out some of their very cool uh, historical artifacts like the 100-ton gun. Thanks for watching.